Hello, this is Ron Powell, and you're listening to Fast Forward on the World Transformed. This program presents conversations with thought leaders who are shaping our future through new ideas and new technologies. In this edition of Fast Forward, Tom Traubitz, Senior Director of Product Strategy with SAP, talks with our hosts, Phil Bowermaster and Stephen Gordon, about the revolutionary changes that are occurring in the data management landscape. Businesses today work with massive volumes of data in a confusing array of types and structures, and any tolerance that businesses or their customers may have once had for data bottlenecks and wait times are long gone. Today, everything happens in real time. As technologies and business models evolve in unexpected directions, what new options and what new risks do organizations face? Let's explore. The future begins right now. Live to see it, friends, and welcome to the World Transform. This program is your guide to an astounding future that lies ahead, a future that will be here sooner than you think. I'm Phil Bowermaster, and I'm pleased to introduce our very special guest for today's program, Tom Traubitz. Tom is a Senior Director of Product Strategy with SAP's Product and Innovations Group, specializing in enterprise-class data warehousing and analytics. He has spent the past 25 years designing, engineering, testing, and marketing large-scale networked information management systems for a wealth of clients throughout the United States and the world. And on a personal note, Tom is a former colleague and longtime friend, my, my old boss, as a matter of fact. Tom, welcome to Fast Forward on the World Transformed. Hi, Phil. Great to be here. Well, it's great to have you. And hey, who's asking the questions now, huh? <laughs> This should be some fun. Okay, well, we also have with us in the virtual studio my co-host, Stephen Gordon. Stephen, why don't you get things started for us today? Thanks, Phil. Tom, why don't we begin by taking a look at the data revolution that Ron described in his introduction. Let's start with the first big driver. The sheer volume of data that organizations contend with today. Is big data still the right term? Is that how we need to describe it? Or are we moving on to something else? That's a good question, Stephen. The reality is is that big data is a term that I've never been tremendously fond of personally. Uh, I've been in the industry and doing large network data systems for, you know, a little over 30 years. And big data seems to be something that we always throw at data we can't reach or we can't quite make use of yet. To give you an example, when I started out in the industry, I was working for the United States government, and big data to us was a stack of 20 quarter-inch tapes in cartridges with a robot to put those tapes onto different uh, tape players. And uh, the total system stored roughly a half gigabyte, you know, 500 megabytes. So, you know, less than than a thumb drive you could buy today. Uh, And we thought that that was huge. And that required programming and enormous amount of effort. So that was big data in the 1980s. Then, you know, big data kind of got a little bit bigger. And we started saying by the 1990s, well, you know, a terabyte's a big data. And, you know, now terabyte is, again, smaller than most disk drives you could buy at Fry's. <laughs> so today, you know, we're starting to talk about things in terms of petabytes. And we're talking about data that is, you know, many times bigger than the total text of books in the uh entirety of the Library of Congress, for example. So what it really amounts to is is that we have lots and lots of data, but what's also changing for us is the kinds and varieties of data that are coming in and what we can make use of. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of those kinds of data, maybe talk about what's going on with uh, the Internet of Things, machine learning, some of those some of those kind of data-intensive applications that are that are driving up those volumes. Well, 
for a long time, we ignored any data that didn't look like an Excel spreadsheet. So if it was you know, simple text and simple numbers, that was pretty much what business data revolved around, and everything else was kind of out there, but you know, needed to be handled by humans. So large bodies of text were just kind of sunk into PDFs or documents or even paper files. We didn't really pay that close attention to data on maps. You know, there were, I had a few clients that were very into mapping, but uh, they had businesses that were very specialized around that. But for most ordinary businesses, we didn't really think about mapping and location. That was difficult to deal with. Uh, but nowadays, everything is a transponder that can give your position on the Earth to the nearest couple meters. So we have geospatial data. Almost everything in, in the way of machinery can now talk, and it can tell us things like, does it have all of its units? Is it working well? So there's a lot of event data that is coming from machinery. Everything from copiers to Coke machines are sending data. Right now, Disney is experimenting with putting little transponders on the wrists of all of their guests so that they know where they are in the park and what they are signing up for and things like that. And it works with a phone app. So they're getting huge amounts of data from their clientele. That's no experiment. The, that, that is full-time business as usual now at yep. Disney. Every, everybody yep. who goes there is pretty much being tracked all the time by the, I guess, the big mouse. Well, at least certainly everybody that is uh, staying in the hotels are. I still sneak in without a bell around my neck yet. Uh, <laughs> but yes, they do track everybody really closely. Also, people are generating an enormous amount of social data. People, people are giving up a lot of information about themselves for free on Twitter and Facebook and so forth. So there's a lot of personal data that we can learn about individuals that have voluntarily uh, been projected into the environment. And in fact, people usually on different shopping sites are quite willing to tell the shopping site about their interests so they get personalized recommendations. But the problem for all of this is, is that the machine data, like those transponders, is very, very simple. It may just give you a latitude and longitude, and if you're lucky, the machine that collected it put down a timestamp of when it read it. And that's all the information you have, and that can be somewhat useful, but if you're thinking about, for example, tracking packages, where the package is going and whether it's on the right truck or, or the right boat or the right plane is far more useful, and so we have to correlate that information against a much bigger background or universe of data. So that's where the trouble has started coming in, is we're able to collect a lot of data, but making usable sense of that data is still very, very challenging. Well, a lot of it is the combination of the two things, too, isn't it, when you look at the volume and the different kinds, because you think of something like streaming data. I mean, back in the day, we used to think, back in the day when big data meant something a lot smaller than it does now. We, we used to think that our transactional systems were cranking out all this data. We thought it was a large amount of data. Relative to what we're seeing today, of course, it's, it's pretty small, but it was all nicely predictable in terms of how data was formatted. Now you've got new formats like geospatial, new formats like graph and things, things like streaming data, but also just coming in such huge quantities. You look at something like social where both the structure of it is weird and you're just being inundated. By it, right? It, it seems to me it's both of those things working together that's really causing the, the heartburn. Yeah, and that's another thing is, is that even back in those days when we were really heavily in the transactions, what human beings were really dealing with were often summaries, you know, averages, yeah. individuals. They weren't tending to deal with little points of data. Well, now the little points of data are really developing into very big clouds of points of data that need to be treated much more sophisticated statistically. And that's where things like machine learning and predictive analytics are coming in, because we really need to come up with electronic aids to make this data usable for human beings to actually make business decisions. And so that starts creating a new rise of the need to understand somewhat what is the underlying statistics of the data. It's very easy to draw the wrong conclusion from statistics. So machine learning and statistical algorithms have to get a lot smarter. And that's certainly where at SAP we've been putting a lot of work into our analytic product lines is to give some prepackaged statistical and analytic and machine learning systems that are already tuned to particular tasks so that you don't have to develop scientifically from the ground up something that's going to give you reliable understanding of your data. Real time is a big part of this too, uh, right, Tom? It, it's one thing to know where a package or a person was yesterday, but what you, you're able to accomplish now is, you know, where something is or someone is 
right now. And th- that's a big part of the picture as well, isn't it? Absolutely. Both culturally, we've been moving closer and closer to people wanting things right now. Patients' level of customers and quite a variety of fields is short. And the opportunities then start necessarily becoming shorter. So, for example, it's much better to be able to treat a customer's need right there on the phone, for example, so that you don't have to have them call back. Or when they're placing an order and you notice that they're not getting all the parts they need for, for example, repairing a motor vehicle, that you recommend you know, did you know that that particular turn signal lever, for example, doesn't come with the pin necessary to connect it to the steering column? So maybe if you broke the pin, that's what you need to order as well. Uh, to bring up a problem that I've had <laughs> recently where I ordered the part and I didn't get all the pieces to it because the system was not smart enough to recommend to me, hey, you really need to order this assembly of pieces <laughs> To get well, something done. My experience lately with sites like Amazon is it's so smart, it's, it's spooky at times. It's, it's making recommendations to me for things that, I, you know, I was just thinking about needing like 30 seconds before. How did they even know? But uh, they have yeah. some pretty good algorithms, I guess. Well, that's, the, that's sort of becoming the spooky effect of machine learning. Right. Is that machine learning has looked at many, many customers such as yourself, and based on that, it is recognized connections. And so even if you're just looking at something on the Amazon website, it knows that you're, you're hovering on a particular page. And it says, ah, he's interested in that. What have other people been interested? So it can start making those spooky predictions based on your pattern of browsing their website. Yep. But still can't figure out that if you've got a working turn signal, you still need some way of turning it on, right? Still, still can't make that connection. Yeah, it's, it hasn't quite got there yet. The other thing is, is that I noticed that every time I buy shoelaces, I am now offered every shoelace for every kind of shoes uh, <laughs> under the sun. So it gets a little bit aggressive, and that's partially deliberate. One of the things retailers really like to do is increase the number of things on the ticket, the number of things for an individual sale, because that reduces the overhead for the total sale of those items which means net profit goes up. So to a certain extent, flooding you with recommendations, they're actually kind of throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what sticks when there's not enough built-up statistical database to say with surety that you're not going to want you know, another set of fashionable shoelaces for uh, those 20-year-old loafers. Might as well stock up on every kind you've ever had or will have, right? Or never had while you're at it. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about different kinds of databases in terms of the tools, the infrastructure that carries all this data and tries to move it around in real time. You know, there was a time when a business would divide its data into two really broad categories. You'd say you've got your transactional data and you've got your analytical data. And for a while, that was then followed with the idea that there were two kinds of database. And you and I were once strong proponents of that idea, that there's actually one kind of database for transactions and another kind of database for analytics. But now you've got all these new data types and structures. So I guess the first question is, do those categories still apply, transactional and analytics? And if not, what, what categories should we apply? Yeah, that's a very good observation. What has happened is for a long time, we just did transaction processing databases. We called them a lot of different things. We called them automatic data processing and so forth. But the reality was just getting the data written down was enough of a challenge for us that doing that and creating simple reports from that was enough. As things like online transaction processing really developed and we could start taking lots of transactions at a time, we discovered that there was a problem with database technology in general, which was that if there was a lot of transactions happening, then it was difficult to find a point in time where we could create an analysis of the data because it was always changing. And so we could slow down the number of transactions we were taking or block them to do that analysis. And that would then slow down the transaction processing thing. But the machines were just running fast enough, so we couldn't afford to do that. Right. So we got into kind of a deadly embrace between people who wanted to do statistical analysis and people who just needed to record, say, the entire stock ticker, all the data that was being traded. One of my early clients was E-Trade. And what they had to do was, of course, take everybody's orders and deal with the stock ticker and everything like that. But at the same time, people who were also trying to plan what they were going to buy wanted to do analysis. So the way 
computer scientists fix this, if that can be called the right term, was to separate the two. We would create databases which were, in a sense, a snapshot of data frozen at a particular time, and we continuously refresh that snapshot. We'd call that a report server or a data mart or later a data warehouse and keep transactions and data warehouses separated. And early on, we used sort of batch processes to connect them. So every every night, for example, we would copy the data out of the transaction system into the data warehouse. And that worked pretty well until things really started getting bad uh, as, say, online commerce came about. One of the, the th- examples I often use is, is that I placed an order back in the 1990s from the web, back when that was you know hip and still pretty interesting and daring to do. And I noticed that my apartment number didn't get taken when the order was placed, whether I forgot to type it on the form. So there's an 800 number to call. And I called their customer service. And I said, I just put in an order, the order number, so-and-so. Uh, I noticed my apartment number's on there. Can you update the record? And the customer service person says, oh, you'll need to call back tomorrow because I'm on the customer service database and we don't get that data from the transaction processing database until overnight. Wow. So this wow. this created a gap when their sort of permanent records were not tied to, say, the shopping cart records because the shopping cart system had to run fast enough to take all the orders. Just to go with that for a moment, that sounds crazy from e-commerce standpoint, but that kind of mm-hmm. that kind of lagged very standard for enterprise systems back in those days, right? That was not yeah. that not out of line at all. Yeah, and it was crazy at the time. The Army certainly thought so, and so they and a couple of institutions on the financial services side came to uh, Sybase and said, this isn't working. We need a fix for this. And so we developed a very clever system uh, called replication, which would gradually feed the changes all the time. So the gap between the transaction processing system and the data warehouse was much smaller, only a few minutes. And the way we did that was is that we would sneak a peek at the transaction log of the transaction processing system. So we wouldn't even tell the transaction processing system we were there. We'd just kind of peek over its shoulder and see what it was writing down. And then whenever it wrote down something interesting, we would then copy that over to the data warehouse. And that connected them together a little bit better. But even so, five minutes, ten minutes of latency doesn't work in a lot of situations, like the currency markets, for example. You really need to be able to do things in real time. And we also had to sort of anticipate what people wanted to know. So replication was a kind of a patch to connect the two, but they were still separate. Tom, let's talk about how HTAP can address the big challenges that businesses currently face, like integrating the Internet of Things into their operations. Well, that's where I think things really started to change, was that the separation wasn't working for us. And so we took a new look with all of the technical materials and changes that we could now do with databases uh, in the early 2000s. And so what we looked at was, could we build a database that could do both at the same time? And so Gartner coined the term hybrid transactional analytic platform, or HTAP. Forrester coined the term translytical. They both mean the same thing, which was to have a platform that could do both at the same time. SAP was extremely interested in this because we were the leader in ERP software, CRM software, and more and more I2, which essentially is industrial workflows of uh, information. So we took a completely new look at databases and said, you know what? In memory is now possible. What we used to think had to be put down on spinning disks didn't have to be. And spinning disks are 10 to 100 times slower than memory, even the slowest memories you want to think of. We also looked at how data was organized. Because of our history, we organized data transaction after transaction after transaction, almost like a tape coming out of a calculator, just stamping down those transactions. That's not a terrible organization for recording, but when it turns out for analyzing, that's actually not a very good organization. Instead, by organizing the data where we can look at entire strings of attributes, such as what state people live in. Uh, We can look at that attribute as an isolated thing, or we can look at different groups of people that need different kinds of insurance packages. We could separate by the attribute of these things. We could do analysis a lot faster. In fact, we produced a database that, much to our surprise, was between 100 and 1,000 times faster at answering lots of analytic questions. Things like cost of goods sold used to be a calculation that would take an ordinary database a day or more for a large enterprise. 
we can now do those in minutes with this new database technology, which we dubbed HANA, which is our leading in-memory database platform. And it's really designed around an entirely new set of algorithms, really for the 21st century, in order to give that speed and performance so that you can do both constantly recording all the changes that are happening in your business or constantly recording everything that is coming from the Internet of Things and analyzing it as it happens. So we can actually run continuous analytics in the database on data as it's changing and therefore make real-time assessments of that and then signal those real-time assessments back to people who need that data. You know, it's interesting. You can think about there's kind of these two threads that are occurring. And on the one hand, while SAP is carving out new ground with HANA and saying, let's put the whole database or let's put big big share of the database in memory and we can have we can have transactional processing and analytical processing all going on in there at the same time. While that's occurring, the thing that... Stephen started out with his first question is also going on this whole big data issue where there's so much data that organizations are just looking for any place to dump it, right? Any place to put it. And you get this whole concept of the data lake. You've got Hadoop and you've got these other big NoSQL repositories where it's just, I've got so much data, I've got to put it someplace. I'm going to put it in this commodity hardware. I'm going to put it up in the cloud and it's not always all that easy to get to it, and sometimes it's not as quick to get to it as we would like, as it might have been if it had been sitting in a, in a more structured environment, but at least we have some access to it. Now, how does, how does a technology like HTAB, which is everything in memory, right? It's a, it's a wonderful idea if it's all just there when you need it. How does that fit in with the world where organizations have also been building these big lakes, these, these massive repositories of data? That's an interesting thing that's been happening. And I think it's happening for a number of reasons, one of which is we're learning that data has different values. For example, you know, when I pay a bill, that's probably a fairly high values, while, you know, what I had for lunch today, not not as high a value. And so we see a stratification of data when it comes to businesses. And so certainly the ERP, the general ledger, is very high value data. That has to be right. And in fact, if you're a publicly traded company, if it's not right, you get to be visited by some guests from the SEC. So we know that that data is high value. But on the other hand, we're gathering a lot of data that was valuable in the moment. It may be valuable for further analysis that, but for example, when a package is delivered, it's valuable for a certain length of time, you know, usually until the person who received the package sees that the package has been received, the person who sent the package sees the package was received, and then eventually, a few weeks later, who cares? You know, that package was delivered, and it just kind of goes into this repository. So it's not that valuable to the business anymore. It's cooled off. So cooler data, data that is no longer as valuable to the company, is not something that we really want to store in memory memory being a more expensive system than, say, the cheapest disks you can get. So that's why you see data lakes of commodity hardware allows you to put this data that is cooled off in a place where it can reside. And then later, if you want to do a whole analysis, for example, you're trying to do patterns of routes where package times are missed, you know, where delivery commitments are missed, you can kind of do an after-the-fact analysis on that data, but you didn't need to do it immediately. You can do that kind of out of the current moment in time. You know, whether the package is in the hands of the recipient or not, that's a very important question. It's also important that, hey, this same route over the last two months has a 3% failure rate, and therefore the driver needs to be talked to. But that's something that you can develop at a little bit slower, more leisurely pace in the business than instantaneous. So you don't need to spend as much money to know that answer. So it's all about balancing the profit to the company or the needs of the company against the cost of maintaining and analyzing that data. So what we've done at SAP and what many others are also doing is we're putting the data into multiple tiers. So we usually have the hottest tier, which is data in memory. Then we'll have a middle tier, which is usually still disk-based. In our case, we use a very powerful bitmap technology, SAP IQ, which forms the backbone of our middle tier on disk. And then a third tier is to go out to a data lake, which these days is usually some form of NoSQL storage, such as Spark or Hadoop. It just warms my heart, Tom, that you've managed to shout out for both Rep Server and IQ. I just want to say, as a, for, for all the Sybase folks. Like, oh, have, having been product managers and uh, marketers for those things, they're still near to my heart. 
as Absolutely. as product technologies and it's it's great to see where things like the IQ technology which was first really put together in the late 80s and then came to Sybase in the early 90s how far that technology has come even when we were still facing a lot of early technical challenges and how much the computers could do your computers can do a tremendous amount more than they could do in you know over the last 20 years in fact the big Frontier is using graphics cards with large clusters of simultaneous processors to do different kinds of machine and pattern learning technologies. So yeah, you can see that evolution of IQ over time. And speaking of things evolving over time, let's look ahead to some of the challenges that businesses can expect to face in the years to come. How do you think a technology like HTAP is going to help them face those kinds of challenges. As I mentioned earlier, there's a natural reduction in the time of people's patience. There's been a lot of studies as to why that's happening. So just making your clientele happier will be a competitive advantage. But I think there's going to be some real changes in how we do business in a lot of areas. I'll give an example. Uh, I had a friend in the hospital, and so he he had some surgery, and I decided to go and sit with him, which largely amounts to watching your friend sleep under heavy sedation and being incredibly bored, sitting in a hospital with a lot of beeping. But I noticed that all the nurses are now pushing around carts with computers on them. And every drug he was given, every bit of treatment is being scanned with hand scanners. And in fact, when his doctors, he had a whole team of doctors, a surgeon, a specialist on a particular organ, another specialist, which was his floor doctor. And they all go to little rooms and type up their notes immediately. So they're available to all the other doctors on the team. Now, right now, this is a very mechanically manual system. They leave orders for the nurses and so forth. But hospitals have to do a lot of other things. One of the main problems in hospitals is to make sure that you don't do something that is going to be detrimental to the patient's recovery. Right. And so you could start doing machine learning and see, hey, in this particular protocol A, if the patient has symptom B, then for God's sake, don't do C without checking with the floor physician. So machine learning could start making those connections between physician learning and particular cases of more complex disease treatment. The other area hospitals are very, really interested in, and I was was cleanliness, that essentially the number one problem for surgical patients is post-op infection. And so they have a lot of protocols. So again, the systems could start machine learning where those protocols break down and start improving health outcomes simply by improving that real-time nature of seeing and warning a nurse or another caregiver before something happens. Uh, A minor thing happened with my friend. He was given the wrong food. You know, like most people before surgery, they're starved, and then afterwards uh, they came, but they gave him too much food, and Mm. that kind of made him sick to his stomach. Very uncomfortable. It It wasn't particularly dangerous. But if, again, there had been some machine learning there, it would have offered a better menu that would safer for him to digest, given his, his immediate outcome after surgery. So that's one example. In business and retail, you know, I kind of mentioned some examples we were discussing, but you know, really getting more things on the ticket because you're recommending the right things to the customer, I think we're going to see more and more that you're going to get a renewal of a personalized service that I used to get from the country hardware store. I mean, I'd go in and say, I'm trying to fix something, and the guy who's been running the hardware store for 30 years says, yeah, you need this part and this part and this part, and he helped me package it all up. Now that that kind of level of personalized service has sort of gone away because there's so many more people and so much fewer people vending it, we can now start using machine learning to start restoring that so not everybody has to be an expert in repairing a lawnmower, for example. The computer can help them identify what parts they need. Predictive maintenance is coming online. More and more, your car is going to tell you when something needs to be maintained. You know, it has trouble lights and things like that, but I think it's going to get much smarter about telling you before it breaks down that, you know, your starter's been misbehaving. Uh, You really should take it in and have the starter check. Or the the water pump has been fluctuating too much. Maybe somebody needs to look at that water pump before it fails and then you find yourself stranded. Absolutely. Exciting things ahead. Tom, thanks for taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, it's great to be here, Stephen and Phil. Great having you with us, Tom. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of Fast Forward on the World Transformed. My thanks to Ron Powell and Stephen Gordon, and our special thanks once again to Tom Trubitz for being with us today. And thank you all for listening. We hope you will join us again as we continue to explore a future that is unfolding before us in unexpected ways and at a breathtaking pace. 
And until next time, live to see it. To learn more about SAP and their approach to hybrid transactional analytical processing, visit sap.com slash HANA, H-A-N-A. To learn more about this program, visit worldtransform.com. Thanks for listening.